Thanks for the video. I'll put the So, thanks for the uh, attention, sorry for the delay. My talk is, I wasn't sure how long this uh, presentation was, and this is meant to be somewhat of an interactive or sort of brainstorming about optimizations for dynamic languages. One of the areas that I've been working on recently is characterization of dynamic languages and performance of dynamic languages on modern architectures, on current architectures and systems. And so what I wanted to present was some of the differences in the workloads that occur for dynamic languages, uh, such as Python, Ruby, PHP. What we've observed there, what are the opportunities for uh, better optimizations in GCC, given the types of characteristics of different types of code that exist in, in these languages compared to, let's say, a spec benchmark or a web server, and maybe get some, some feedback from the audience about uh, you know, areas that the GCC can be improved in ways to, to tackle the performance challenges that these languages present. Uh, so basically I'm going to give a little bit of an introduction about the, the languages and then give sort of alternating back and forth between some characteristics and some optimization opportunities and uh, hopefully get some, some more discussion about that. Um, so basically, as I said, this is about um, options for scripting languages, dynamic scripting languages, interpreters, uh, and this is providing more and more workloads moving to these types of, of languages, and more and more use away from Java, and just uh, the popularity of these languages is increasing. This is sort of a back outside. This isn't the latest uh, information about uh, the popularity of, of languages in the you know, C and C++ are all the first, but in general, one can see these dynamic languages making a large amount of progress and inroads in the usage uh, for applications. Um, and it's used for the flexibility of dynamic typing, high-level data structures. Uh, to a large extent, it's actually used because of the very extensive frameworks and libraries, in other words, Ruby is very popular because of Rails, and uh, Python is very popular because of so Django, there's NumPy, so it's sort of slightly wider use there. PHP obviously has a great deal of use within uh, web servers. Uh, Python is very popular within Google, available for Google App Engine. A lot of uh, PHP is used inside Facebook, so there's more and more extensive use of these languages and opportunities for, uh, for optimization and for improving the performance, especially these very large scaled out systems, whether it be YouTube or Facebook uh, or Twitter, use of Ruby. Um, so what are the, the characteristics? This is a comparison of spec and on the right, spec in the middle, spec FP in Python. And what you see, one of the big differences in uh, the languages, especially as C Python and, and applications running in C Python, that's what Python means there, is the functions are much smaller. You have a large number of functions with comparatively spec, which is where many companies, many compilers have focused in the past, there's a big difference in the size of the functions. This is Fortran calling those functions, a lot more abstraction, a lot more uh, individual functions being called, doing less work. Um, so you know, the question there is what can be done where there's more overhead in the application, uh, in the uh, more overhead in the, uh, in, in the function call overhead for a large number of small functions, and what can be improved. Um, so here's a, a, another example in C Python is the what's the, the common path? And you can see that for is a uh, Python benchmark front that Google developed called Unlabeled Swallow, and that uh, some of the more realistic benchmarks are Django and Ruby. And if one looks at the profile of this application, the actual the largest function, the, the most important one is pi, pi eval, eval frame, which gets about 25% of the instructions, but then very close after for all of these realistic applications, not there's, there's some that are more 
uh, floating point intensive, numerical intensive, which showed different characters. But right after that is this function called look dick string. And look dick string is actually an optimized version of a general dictionary lookup for strings. And what happens in that function actually is there's a very common case for very unpopulated dictionaries. That it will, assuming that it, it, it really was a string, it'll go through and calculate this hash and then normally find the value of ones if it's there in the first bucket. So the common case is just immediately finding that key and returning it. And then there's a lot of this uncommon case, which is what happens in a lot of these dynamic languages and their implementations for interpreters, which is to focus, on, to, to have specialized cases for fast paths. In other words, um, in most of these dynamic languages, all the values, for instance, are box. And so it will then have a fast path between, let's say, an integer and add, and not call it the general uh, dynamic calculation of what's the type of this. This, uh, this, this variable, and, and in the most general case for performing, let's say, a concatenation with an addition operator instead of an add. So there are a lot of special cases that occur either in dispatch loop or in the implementation of functions. And the problem here is that there is a lot of overhead in the APIs for power, for x86, for all of these uh, different processors and targets to handle this uncommon case. There's a lot of additional saved registers. And so, in this next slide, you can see this difference here of all of this additional stack that is calculated, you know, created here on the left, and all through for the case where it may call what did. So this is a lot of, you know, overhead in memory allocation, memory traffic, and all the preparation for the unusual, uncommon case of actually calling into the general look if it didn't happen to be a string or if it didn't happen to find the object in the first button. So this gets to one optimization that we were looking that we've been starting to implement in GCC of shrink wrap. And what you can see if GCC's implementation isn't powerful enough yet, but if one takes that uncommon case that I showed at the beginning and manually separates that out into another function, all of a sudden that huge amount of stack allocation to traffic for the uncommon case here drops away extensively and all goes into this looked extreme special function. So all of a sudden you get a much improved much smaller overhead for the stack allocations. So the question is, can we improve, for instance, the implementation of shrink wrapping in GCC to be able to capture these types of cases automatically, which occur in dynamic languages, trying to specialize common cases because of the inherent overhead slow performance of these interpreters. So this is sort of a characteristic of the implementation of interpreters of these languages. And here's you know, one opportunity that provided you know, a substantial performance improvement. In, and as I showed here, you know, this is you know, the second most important function, 5% of the, the current cycle time without that optimization. And it drops down to be much more efficient with this type of manual outline, but which is not possible to be done manually for all of these applications, and this is an opportunity for automation and better optimization of the compiler. Another characteristic of these dynamic languages is that they have a very different performance behavior in branches. There's many more branches and many more forward branches, and in most processors, the assumption is that a backward branch will be taken and a forward branch won't be taken. So the, this difference in behavior for dynamic languages is actually fighting against the processor's assumptions and can benefit from additional hints, from additional profiling and feedback through whatever hints the, the processor or assembly language allows to 
better characterize the, the branch behavior, the branch history table, better populate that in the processor. So this is another difference in the behavior of dynamic languages from more traditional high-performance computing or you know, transaction database types of, of workloads. Um, so as I said, you know, the brand, better branch prediction, branch hints, and options for you know, better utilization of profile-directed feedback to improve the uh, control flow information uh, for, to, to better balance or match the processor's behavior. Um, another work that, that uh, Jan Vitek and a number of people working in uh, JavaScript characterization, dynamic language characterization, is that even though these are dynamic languages, the actual behavior of the language itself, of the, the programmer, the call sites really aren't as dynamic. So one can see that the percent of the, the, the call sites that are actually um, polymorphic versus so not polymorphic for a large number of websites, this is, this is JavaScript. So this is switching from Python to JavaScript, but a large number of popular websites, one can see that, that the, the percentage is almost you know, 100% of the call sites are non-polymorphic. So this is, you know, there's a single call versus how many had multiple uh, calling to different functions, uh, different actual instances at the call site. So, I mean, other than, than Facebook, um, you know, Google Maps, Gmail, Twitter, it's not very dynamic in the real behavior of the application. So again, is this an opportunity for GCC to do additional de-virtualization, additional opportunities to optimize the calls to these functions based again on profiling that functions really aren't as dynamic as as the programmer would guess. So it reflects the real use of polymorphism or just uh, the code that is written is not polymorphism? No, this is the dynamic. The real use. The real use. No, no, the, the code is, is written often in the general case, but the real use is that the, the code that there is, you know, some small tail at the end that in, in, in Jan's paper there's actually one or two functions that have 10,000 different functions, uh, different instances called at the call site. But that was you know, just one or two and very rare versus having tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of calls of uh, a, at a call site to a single instance of a function. So again, de-virtualization, specialization, more opportunities for profile director feedback for the behavior, the real behavior of the application which doesn't have the dynamism that is inherently available or isn't currently, um, for whatever reason, developers aren't utilizing or writing the code in to um, leverage the full dynamism of the language. Yes, sir? Just to uh, chime in for a moment, I think that in a way this is perhaps not surprising because you know, it was likely to be written with a particular data type in mind. Yes. Okay. Using dynamism as a way of future proofing, but here and now you're proofing string algorithm or a numeric algorithm. Exactly, but the point is exactly that because people are future proofing or writing it in this dynamic language, but aren't writing dynamic code, this is now an opportunity. And what can the compiler do based on this knowledge, based on the way that people are actually programming the language as opposed to the most conservative? You know, possible way that the language is utilized. And again, it requires profile directed feedback or some sort of guards because you know this, this call site could change, it could become more dynamic. But if there are only you know a single at that best, or just a few, you know, one, two, three different functions that are actually the instances that are called at this call site, how can the uh, compiler generate more efficient code for this specific you know case and knowledge of the use as opposed to or the more general you know, jumping into anywhere. You can do some sort of a, a, a small you know, decision tree, small direct calls. And again, if you're, I mean, I know that Intel has done some work on, on you know, being able to uh, sort of de-virtualize uh, indirect branches, but if one can perform these as, as the compiler can convert these into direct branches, that improves the branch history and the processor as well. So again, the transformations that the compiler can do to actually produce better performance in the real implementation and, and usage and, and running of these applications. 
So, um, and, uh, another question is, that, okay, well, you know, JITS will just solve everything. I mean, this, it's all going over the JITS. We'll just, uh, and the main, one of the main projects that I've been working on at IBM is an intro project called Theron, where we, it's very similar to Google's Unlabeled Swallow project, uh, which was connecting up, uh, in IBM's case, IBM's internal JITS that we use sort of for our job uh, uh, implementation to the C Python as a virtual machine, converting the C Python bytecodes uh, directly into translating it to uh, the JIT and uh, utilizing the, the JIT to try to improve the performance. The same way that Unlabeled Swallow connected the LLVM JIT to C Python. And um, 1.0 here is, is C Python 2.6 performance. And um, so this is comparing. Uh, IBM's JIT, uh, US's US Unlinked Swallow, PyPy, and Jython is, if you're unaware, of a converting Python to Java, running in the Java VM. And this Java VM is also, again, running in on IBM's uh, Java VM. And so, you know, Jython, the current version of Jython has actually improved things a little bit. I mean, so it's not as bad as, as we see here, but you can also see in this the, the IBM's uh, Fiorata project is basically duplicating the results that Unlabeled Swallow achieved. It's a little better because Unlabeled Swallow specifically didn't want to make modifications to CPython. IBM made some additional optimization in CPython, which uh, allows the performance to be a little bit better. But basically, using a traditional JIT, a JIT that was designed for Java or for a statically type language, um, pretty much hits a wall, and uh, it's not, and doesn't show a lot of benefit. I mean, the hope, the assumption was that if one could in, translate the, the Python code, the Southern Dynamic Language code, into uh, a method JIT, a very powerful, effective method JIT, and, and then could inline all this with its own, with the JIT's own profiling uh, based on the actual behavior of the, the real application. As it's running, perform enough inline and see enough of the code, eventually it could see through all of the, uh, the various uh, helper functions to improve the behavior uh, and, and get in you know, substantial speedups. And what people have, have seen is that uh, PyPy, this is PyPy 1.7 here, has achieved a lot of performance with the custom JIT. It's uh, a tracing JIT, but that the traditional JITs have not been very effective at improving the performance. Uh, so, but um, the issue here is, is not so much what JITs can and cannot work, but again, the way that the PyPy actually functions, and that here's uh, another set of benchmarks, Richard, which again shows PyPy uh, showing a, a lot of performance. I mean, just in fact, PyPy achieves about five and a half times, 5.5 times better performance across a wide variety of benchmarks. Um, Unlaid Swallow, if you're up getting maybe like two times better, two to three times better, um, if, if, if not less. So what, what people are doing because of these limitations of the JIT so far is using various types of conversions. There's Cython, which is uh, a tool mainly for writing C Python extensions, you write it in Python, it converts it to C or C++. Uh, Facebook developed their uh, uh, something called Hip Hop, which is, is a conversion tool for taking uh, PHP code, their PHP code, and converting that into C++. Uh, PyPy is actually a translator. And all of these translators are being then compiled by GCC or G++. So this is a lot now of machine-generated code for these languages, which are becoming much more popular. The question is, what can be done for this type of behavior as, as GCC becomes, it extends from being not only a direct target for languages C, C++, Go, Fortran, uh, you know, Objective-C, but now is being used as a target for optimizing Versions and even PyPy, the way that PyPy works is it is written in Python, 
and it's actually the, the what, it goes through a translation process. It's a JIT, but the JIT is created by this big Python source code, multiple files that are all load, run through Python and converted into, see it does, it's, it's written in a, in a subset of Python, it's not as dynamic, it allows uh, static type analysis of the code, so it can be uh, converted into a static type language, and it's converted into a language that is C compiled by GCC. So this is now a very large amount of machine generated code that all of these dynamic attempts at improving the performance of dynamic languages are generated. Um, so as I mentioned, there's the they're creating basically large decision trees, um, uh, I mean, uh, you know, deterministic finite automaton, there are large you know, number of switches, um, you know, basically traversing the internal states of this, uh, this, this virtual machine that they created, that then uh, will, most of the time, I mean, or, or the, you know, the hope is, will spend most of the time in the JIT, and it's itself generating uh, machine code, but, and as I showed, showing large performance improvement, but when it's falling back because of the guard failure into the interpreter, this is an opportunity for GCC to affect the performance of these systems. Um, there's a large number of also you know, user labels. I mean, there are, I guess uh, Richie's not here. We had this discussion um, a, uh, a few months ago over a problem that PyPy had in performance uh, degradation was because uh, GCC specifically wanted to preserve uh, user labels and didn't want to allow certain movement of code across user labels. And we had a discussion about how that could, restriction could be reduced because this was technically a user label, but it wasn't a user label that the, the, that the Python developer cared about. This was a user label that was artificially created by the translation code. But yet, it was inhibiting an important optimization, a loop optimization, and slowing down some high performance uh, computation that PyPy was actually able to perform well. So, it's that sort of question that we can start raising of given this different type of code that is going to be presented to GCC from an interpreter, I mean, from this type of translation for dynamic languages, what optimizations can GCC develop or focus on? That will improve this, this the performance of this code. Uh, so I don't know if, if people have any additional ideas, uh, we can continue to discuss that. Um, another issue that was raised by uh, the, the GCC, I mean by the uh, the, the PyPy community, is um, because they're actually using a, a fully garbage collected system. They have difficulty accessing. Uh, just finding the roots. I mean, they they're basically have for x86 they're using a special um, special uh, GCC as in statements and just sort of you know groveling through uh, the GCC assembly code to figure out what the roots are. For every other architecture, ARM and, and PowerPC at the moment, they're using something called a shadow stack. And they're keeping the roots sort of in parallel. Um, and a fallback is, is the bone garbage collector. The bone garbage collector is about twice as slow as the, the shadow stack one. But uh, one quick re actually request they made is some way in uh, GCC to be able to provide hints or to um, be able to provide feedback for the for this their JIT and their infrastructure to find the roots, uh, the garbage collection roots of the code that GCC is generating, which which are values are actually uh, you know, pointers, and which are just other random values. So, you know, that's another opportunity for GCC to provide assistance for these languages. Um, and another uh, piece they're actually working on right now, because of the connection between the JIT and the interpreter calling other native functions, the uh, traditional C Python modules and and uh, C type of things is working with FFI, and so uh, the, the foreign function interface that is available through the, the project. And so one question there um, was,
how to allow perhaps automatic introspection of the uh, objects that are being created in a more efficient interface between uh, the, uh, the Python code and some native code instead of using the going through the um, somewhat cumbersome FFI interface uh, and obtain per perhaps being able to directly look at the interface of the function that's being called and having the JIT, um, let's say, parse debugging information, some symbol table information, knowing what the types are, knowing what exactly the, the interface is, and then dynamically generating the codes to call into the function as opposed to going through FFI, just packaging up all the arguments and unpackaging all the arguments and the, the, uh, the sort of standing on one's head and what does for FFI. Um, so one piece that they've actually been working on is this new CFFI uh, interface um, where it's not automatic introspection, but it's an improvement where one can actually embed C code now in the uh, uh, in, in the, the Python code, um, either declaring structures, declaring you know, variable types, declaring uh, calling out to various functions, and it can uh, directly load up these dynamic libraries and call into them without going through uh, a sort of improved FFI module. And so uh, that's basically um, at the either the ABI level, as they were saying, or the API level, uh, being able to do better interface with uh, the uh, C or, or native functions. And so that's sort of the, the list of characteristics of these languages and the um, challenges that, um, that they're faced and that, that present to both GCC and opportunities for GCC to be able to uh, improve the performance of these languages and have um, some sort of a, you know, a, a, a market or a, an opportunity here for better performance with um, Python, Ruby, allow better uh, interfacing with these languages and hopefully you know, provide some unique facilities and capabilities that will um, you know, continue to allow these languages to uh, improve their performance and utilize GCC. So that's basically a summary. Any questions or people have any you know, other suggestions or comments about how GCC can be better optimized for this. It, it sounds to me like um, we might benefit from adding benchmarks to the test suite where the result of the, of the benchmark isn't that it works, but whether the performance is degraded or improved. So, so we, we can see, you know, see what that, their changes are actually having an effect on these benchmarks. And you can have, for example, some of the, the large. Um, you mean, you mean the contributing to the benchmarks in these communities, or these communities contributing benchmarks to GCC? Uh, uh, my, my, my idea is to have benchmarks be part of the GCC test suite, for so example, drive yeah. it off, and then you can see the performance changes, how that is GCC getting better or worse, for right. these particular applications. And then if that became part of the mainstream, my patch does this, by the way, it improves performance in this benchmark, but oh dear, it makes this pipeline thing run slower, and they right. can check it in. Yeah, Back to everybody who says, oh, you're expected to be Well, 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 but, but there are some, I mean, the Pearl per, Bench and SPAC actually is somewhat representative of this. Because, I mean, uh, Mike Serving, there's, you know, you know, similar huge functions with huge overhead. And again, I, I mentioned the, uh, the problem with, with uh, uh, shrink wrap. It was, this, this is actually a problem or, you know, similar to something that happens in um, Perl Bench. And as far as the machine generated code, GCC actually, I mean, machine descriptions are actually produced with going through that. I mean, not only the, um, the, the scheduler, the DFA is produced with the scheduler, but actually the, the whole machine generated code for, for instruction selection in GCC is not that different than the code that, for instance, Python is generated by its translator. So improvements that we make to the performance of GCC itself are being able to better optimize uh, for, for instance, you know, the, the instruction extract and all these, you know, these you know, files that GCC itself creates 
will also improve the performance of high pipe cycle and this other machine generated code. So we do, so not only will it help these other, it will, will improving GCC own performance in for these uh, aspects. And GCC already has, you know, because it's performance of GCC, we already have spent some time optimizing this type of behavior. But it'll help ourselves, it'll help you know, reduce GCC's uh, you know, performance uh, you know, problems and challenges by uh, trying to address some of these similar uh, you know, code examples and challenges. Yeah, you, you mentioned about Perlbench, and in thinking about it, I haven't yet come to a jail conclusion. So, but I've been thinking that rather than just plain shrink wrapping, where you're assuming that you just test an argument and then do the rest of the expensive function, you want to possibly move down to basic blocks and you know have basic blocks then do the same register as we store registers rather than doing it all in all in the protocol. And you know that would help a lot of the interpreter intensive parts of, of, of the benchmark side of the map. Because you're kind of intrigued by that because essentially it's a, it's an argument against inlining if you can identify rare functions. And you know it, it, it makes a lot of sense but I'm thinking that what do you could do for that now? Well, I mean, in my, yeah, it's one of these things, damn if you do, damn if you don't. One of the things we've seen, uh, we see now is very small functions, you know, where you, you do some of these stores, you do some more calls, and then, and then return. Um, the store queue, actually, it'll stall waiting for the store queue because it has to do the, the stores, and then the loads have to wait for the for the stores to, to come back. You know, to but even again, I mean, this is the, you know, the Intel code. Right. I mean, this is, you know, I don't know if HJ, you know, has any comments if, you know, you know the, 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 the latest, you know, IP brief processor will just, you know, be perfectly fine with this or not. But, you know, I'm sure that less memory traffic, I mean, I don't know how much they're doing with the virtualization of the stack in the x86, but, you know, all of these, you know, unnecessary pushes and pops can can't help. So does that pan out in reality? I mean, because from, from a programmer's point of view, what you're saying is that if they take if people take the rare cases and stick them off in separate little functions, their program gets faster without doing anything else. But uh, I've never actually heard of that happening. Yeah, so but, uh, but if you say, I mean, well, in some of these cases, <laughs> it's that you have a thousand line switch state, and and you have 500 cases in the switch state, and one case happens to, to need all 50 registers. And most right. of only no, that's what you say. You know, as, as sort of a of an abstract thought process, yeah, that yeah. makes sense. But I'm, I'm wondering if that actually no, no. But the second one, Stanley, for for this example, it it, it did actually work because uh, it, for this case, what happened is I mean, at first I, mean, I, I, I did this outline. If we had seen in other cases, then that this register saving in the store was a problem. So I actually outlined it this way, and this isn't actually the exactly what I wrote. Because when I wrote it this way, GCC inline came in. <laughs> you have to explicitly say I have to, I have to add, annotate the function to explicitly say no inline to this function. <laughs> and after I did that, then I did get about 10 to 20 percent speed up. For that, for that, that one say it's, interesting. It's, it's, it's an interesting data point for programmers that it may actually be not getting an advantage here, right. not being able to do that here because GC is inlining behind their back is supposedly inlining is always good. Yeah, yeah. So like what bothers me the advantage here for this is the profile where you feedback and the feedback conversation where you uh, and, and I don't know if, uh, if if this is difficult or it's done, but for Mike's example of the, mm -hmm. the switch also having feedback so this right. is Exactly. Well, I mean, not, not just that, but as you're saying, it's, you know, this is another place where one needs to essentially um, reach across GCC's um, intermediate representation boundary. Because part of this is an understanding from the target description what is actually going to be the cost of this call or you know, this inline, because, you know, you know, some of this requires you know, a large number of registers, and without getting some feedback of the register pressure, the number of registers 
you can have the cocoons in light just at GCC's gimbal stage. You know, it, it all looks good. I mean, we're just, you know, and it's, you know, we need to be more careful about the, you know, the register pressure, the register lifetime, and are we creating a, you know, an unnecessary, you know, register lifetime over a common function that doesn't actually need this or commonly yeah, so I'm yeah. not actually the
So it would be easy to add the things to the next Yes. Slide. And so I haven't tried on, on this, and I'm not sure if how the built-in expect interacts with the shrink wrapping. I, I would expect that if you have built-in expect there, and it should help the shrink wrapping. If it doesn't, it sounds like. Yeah. Well, actually, yeah. <laughs> uh, actually, you know, the built-in expect interacts with the uh, function splitting, and if you put the expect there, then the function will be split, and then we will inline it again. So if you prevent the inlining, then it will just work. So, uh, how hard would it be to set, put together some kind of benchmark suite for these type of things? Because, uh, you know, the way I'm tuning the inliner is basically looking on the benchmarks which we have, which are kind of biased. You know, we have specs, we have the C++ benchmarks, which are basically trying to show up that we are not inlining enough. You know, they are always pushing the limits up. And we don't have this type of stuff in, in, in our radar. So, I was recently analyzing a similar problem of the Covray, which is also technically interpreter insight. And, yeah, that, that's precisely the same situation there. So, it would be nice to have some simple benchmarks edit. Yeah, we could definitely work on that. I mean, as you said, we, you know, to, to try to get some artificial ones, maybe not having to build all of Python, other Python things that long. But. Well, we can't build Python, you know, if we have some interesting benchmark. I think yeah. it would be a good addition to the, to the benchmark okay. which we have.